Welcome to the first in a series of introspective conversations on the critical theory of religion with Professor Rudolph J. Siebert. Professor Siebert is an esteemed senior member of the Sociology and Comparative Religion Departments at Western Michigan University. He is also the foremost proponent of the critical theory of religion in the United States, known internationally for his views on the critical theories and their importance to the worldwide future of peace and understanding. Professor Siebert is the founder of the Center of Humanistic Future Studies at Western Michigan University and of two annual international conferences in Dubrovnik and Yalta for the Inter-University Center for Postgraduate Studies in Europe. He has written 15 books and penned close to 400 articles regarding religion and the trends towards alternative global futures. Join Professor Siebert now for his reflections on the critical theory of religion. In 1914, during the First World War, um, the critical theorists were young men and they were rather optimistic and when the war started they were even um, for it in a certain way until the first casualties came. And then uh, out of this horror of the war, uh, these young fellows asked uh, fundamental questions. They asked which great scholar or philosopher or thinker could help them in order to uh, explain what was happening and so on. So um, what uh, Horkheimer and his friend Pollock and a woman from Paris who was related to, uh, to Horkheimer, uh, they uh, had a little coup together in which, which uh, almost was a religious coup in a certain sense in which they wanted to create an island of happiness. They called it the island of happiness. Uh, they were, came from the middle class, they came from the bourgeoisie, but they were somehow uh, alienated from this type of culture. And they tried to establish a new culture which had some uh, religious elements. It failed in the end. There is a little uh, uh, piece of poetry by uh, by Horkheimer, which describes that first experiment. So we could almost say that um, the critical theory was a critical uh, theory of religion before it became uh, a critical theory uh, of uh, society. So, uh, um, and when we started to develop the critical theory of religion out of the Frankfurt School and so on, we, we started with these, um, with these first poetical attempts which were quite impressive. I would say that um, the, um, sometimes people say that um, the Horkheimer became religious later in his life or so. But, um, Horkheimer was from the very beginning, he was raised Jewish in Stuttgart <coughs> and then um, uh, also during, he was a member of the synagogue up to the end of his life in, in Switzerland. So there was always a religious underground. And uh, what the critical theory really combined was Judaism on one side and the modern enlightenment. Or concretely, they combined the Decalogue and the second and the third commandment, namely not to make images of the absolute, not to commit idolatry on one side, and on the other hand, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant that the human mind, the human intellect, could not move into the realm of the thing in itself. That was God, um, freedom, and immortality. That man had to stay with the finite things. And uh, Kant, nevertheless, um, on one side, limited science, but he made also room for faith. And for uh, Kant, while one could not say anything about God, or freedom or immortality, uh, one could uh, at least uh, see it as a postulate. That means we needed God, freedom and immortality as a postulate in order to be able to live a human life and to uh, live a decent ethical life. So in that sense, I would say the critical theory in itself had always a religious component. And all what we did was to emphasize and uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, whole um, religious teaching uh, through 50 years in, in the Frankfurt School. And um, so up to today, 
the um, Königer theory of religion, which we developed, remains most closely related to the, uh, um, to the Critical theory of society. Uh, one could say that our theory emphasizes one antagonism in civil society, and that is the one between the religious and the secular, and the critical theory of religion tries to persuade people uh, not to close up the discourse between the religious and the secular fundamentalistically on one side or positivistically and naturalistically on the other side. So the core of the critical theory of religion is to keep the discourse open. So the critical theory of religion has of course learned a lot from Karl Marx. Uh, it has learned to turn around the idealistic dialectic into a materialistic one and uh, also concepts like um, productive forces or productive relations or surplus value and so on. Of course, first of all, um, Marx um, was not so new as, as it may sound. He was deeply rooted in the philosophy of Hegel in his dialectics uh, and in Immanuel Kant, and he was also rooted even in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And um, so the um, Frankfurt School is also sometimes, uh, people have a prejudice that uh, it is Marxist or is neo-Marxist and so on. But also the Frankfurt School is of course not only rooted in Marx, but also in Nietzsche and in Schopenhauer and in all the idealists like Schelling and Fichte and Kant and so on. And then also particularly in the uh, um, Hebrew Bible, in the Decalogue, in the second and the third commandment. And this is true then also for the, uh, for the critical theory of religion, which we have uh, deducted from the critical theory of society. Karl Marx was a Jew. And he was baptized a Lutheran uh, with his family, but um, he had a deep sensitivity for concepts like social justice as we find it in the prophetic literature and in the Psalms and so on. As a matter of fact, the Cap Capital is full of uh, quotations from the Old and the New Testament and so on. So um, usually the bourgeoisie and bourgeois schools are always mentioning that opiate of the people. That was one of three uh, definitions which Marx gave of uh, religion in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of law. And um, so even if one takes this, and, and unfortunately bourgeois scholars never go any further than to, to the other two, but even if one takes the, uh, uh, the first one, what is wrong with opium if people are suffering uh, cancer patients or whatever, uh, so even that uh, betrays some, some uh, sensitivity for religion. It can help people to uh, mitigate their suffering which they have. Um, the bad thing, of course, with, with drugs is that they, people weaken or are weakened in their ability to transform the reality in such a way that it corresponds to their ability. Because happiness means that my ability and my p possibilities outside are corresponding. If I have no possibilities and I have this tremendous potential, I will be unhappy. And vice versa, if I, I have these possibilities and I have no potential or whatever, that is also a very unhappy situation. And so that is the disadvantage of all opiates, of course. And so in that sense, it is a critical thing. And we have to see that Marx, first of all, didn't invent this, but he got it from Hegel. And Hegel had a, a, a applied it only to Hinduism. So if Marx was justified now to apply that to all the world religions, what may have been true for Hinduism and maybe not even for Hinduism adequately, that is a very serious scientific question now. But the definition of opiate is not an entirely negative one. Uh, if one, uh, no, what Marx has in mind is, you know, the suffering of the people under capitalism. But there were two other definitions, namely that religion is the heart of a heartless world and the outcry of the oppressed creature. This sounds prophetic. And these two other uh, definitions have to be taken as seriously as the opiate one. And unfortunately, bourgeois scholars uh, forget this all the time. 
So uh, then uh, I would say that the critical theory and uh, of religion, as we have developed it further, takes very seriously Karl Marx's uh, Christology, namely there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That is a very good Christology from below, and it would be much better in the discourse between Christians and Muslims and Jews if one would start with such a Christology from below, as this is called, instead of a Christology from above with the Trinity and the Incarnation and so on, which may be very hard to, to understand uh, in, in a brotherly discourse with Jews and uh, Islamic people. So uh, this issue, there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That would give the whole interpretation of the New Testament another, uh, another uh, perspective. But then Christianity is no longer in coalition with the ruling classes, uh, with the corporate ruling class, but it is on the side of the poor, as they say. That means the side of the lower classes and the people who produce the surplus value, and um, not on the side of the rich who enjoy the surplus value without working for it. Freud has played an important role for the uh, Frankfurt School. Already in 1930, there was a Freudian Institute in Frankfurt, and uh, it was combined with the uh, uh, theory of uh, society of the Frankfurt School from the very beginning. And we have a group of psychoanalysts who had partially been trained by Freud, um, and uh, they came together and uh, did research about uh, the uh, situation of the German workers. And they followed the great uh, psychoanalyst uh, um, Fromm and um, developed a research uh, instrument by which they tested 8,000 uh, German workers in order to find out how many of them would be authoritarian personalities and how many of them would be revolutionary personalities. And they found out that maybe 10, 15 percent on each side, that means 15 percent uh, uh, revolutionary personalities and 15 percent authoritarian personalities. And on that they based their prediction how much uh, chance National Socialism or Hitler would have uh, with the German working class. And their prediction were quite adequate. Uh, the, um, during the war, as I experienced it, there was always a certain percentage of workers who would follow Hitler fanatically and others who would oppose him and even would go to concentration camp for, for this. So in that sense, uh, Freud played an important role. So, um, but they were also critical from the very beginning to some extent, of course, to a large extent, Freud was, of course, um, enlightenment, an enlightenment person, uh, but at the same time he also became a victim of um, the dialectic of enlightenment. So therefore they in a certain sense uh, critically negated Freud, but also they preserved then and elevated in a certain way, wanted to fulfill the uh, great message of Freud. The theodicy question played an important role for the critical theorists from the very beginning. Horkheimer, Adorno, Fromm and so on, they were all uh, Jewish people, they had a Jewish background, they grew up in, in Jewish uh, families. But as they grew up um, before and during the First World War, they um, somehow became non-conformist believers. That means to some extent, they preserved elements of their Jewish tradition, but others they had to reject. And so it was particularly the um, problem, the theodicy problem in Judaism and in other world religions, which seemed to them to be unresolved. And that was before Auschwitz uh, already. It was during the horror of the First World War with 10 million people dead. And then, of course, fascism and the horror of the uh, uh, Second World War is 60 million people dead, and, and then also Auschwitz and so on. Um, Judaism had only two really uh, theodicy answers, and one of them was that, that uh, um, suffering, human suffering, was the result of uh, uh, personal sins or secret sins. 
And that is a very primitive and archaic type of theodicy, which we find in other religions uh, as well. Antigone would say that is how we, much, how we know how much we sinned from how much we suffered and so on. So we find it in Judaism, we find it also in Christianity and in Islam and so on. So, um, but if we uh, compare this type of a theodicy, let's see with an event like Auschwitz or Treblinka, uh, can we really say that God uh, um, punished these people for secret sins and that six million people were gassed because of their secret sins and so on? What kind of a God would that be who would do something like this? There was a second uh, um, theodicy in Judaism, namely that if we suffer, that this is a test. If we remain faithful, if suffering appears. So Job uh, is, um, is tempted by Satan. God allows Satan to tempt uh, 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 um, Job. And Job uh, um, has a good life. And Satan says, as long as he has a good life, it's easy to have faith. But if things get rough, and so if when he lost all his camels and all his, his family and so on, would he still uh, uh, have faith and so on? So, and it shows in the end that Job really uh, um, somehow accomplished that test and he remained faithful and everything was restored in the end. But if we ask today uh, and, and test this type of a, a theodicy, um, in comparison to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who was tested there? Uh, uh, the, the pilot Tippett, who survived and still is alive today, or um, was it the pilot who committed suicide, or was it the pilot who joined the Trappist order, or was it the, the pilot who uh, ended up in an Air Force insane asylum because he always wrote letters around the world that such a crime should never be committed and so on. So, I mean, was it a test for the little uh, school children who at eight o'clock in the morning on August 8th there were sitting in their uh, classrooms and took their breakfast out when the uh, bomb came down on a parachute and uh, 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 killed uh, 70,000 people and later on, of course, in Nagasaki as well. So, but who was tested? And we see again that a God who would test people like this would definitely be unacceptable, would be a monstrosity. And so um, from the uh, critical theory of religion point of view, uh, neither of these two um, uh, um, theodicy answers is any longer acceptable and would be acceptable for any of the Jewish or the other uh, critical theorists. So there is, of course, another uh, Jewish theodicy, and that is the messianic element, which plays an important role in Marx, but which plays an important role also in, uh, in of course, in Christianity and in Islam, and uh, also in, in the critical theory. <laughs>
and some people are less open and some people are not open at all. So in Judaism, for instance, the orthodoxy would be closed up to modernity, but the conservative rabbi or the uh, reformed rabbi would be much more open uh, concerning questions of homosexuality or whatever uh, modern questions may, may arise. So, um, and here, of course, a critical theory of religion then could be helpful uh, to different religious groups um, how they could reconcile themselves in themselves, how they could have discourse with their own uh, religious brothers and sisters in order to see to what extent a world religion can be reinterpreted in order to be open to the challenge uh, of uh, modernity or to what extent uh, they have to hold on to their identity. The um, antagonism between the religion and the secular is of course a specifically Western affair and um, it is going on since 400 years already. Um, there were beginnings of modernity in China, they invented the um, gunpowder and there were beginnings in, of modernity in Greece, they had uh, little uh, engines, steam engines, but they never put them into the field because there were too many guards which would prevent this. So. The only time that modernity really broke through was then in the Renaissance and the Reformation. And so the critical theory of religion uh, takes this antagonism very seriously. It does not want to play it down. It does not want to have an illusionary type of uh, solution. So it is taken seriously. And uh, while there is a great longing in people to reconcile, the reconciliation must be truthful and must be real because otherwise it breaks open again. So um, that uh, I think that is an important point. And uh, then beyond that, it is of course the emphasis on discourse between the two sides. So the uh, scientists should not laugh about the, the priests or the bishops and say, ha, ah, they believe that God sits in 10 million uh, wombs of women uh, every year and, um, and also um, they are obscurantist, they come from the dark ages and, and so on. And on the other hand, the uh, bishops should not shout and scream and say these naturalists take the last little bit of morality out of our youth and so on, because this is not very fruitful. So the issue is rather to uh, understand the other side to know that these are two different languages. There is a mythical language and there is a scientific language. If science makes certain well-based statements, then they cannot be contradicted by, by faith. Uh, faith has to be reformulated and of course science always has to look if uh, something may be weak in the theory. Of course the uh, theory of evolution needs a lot of completion still, um, but uh, so there's so much evidence has been accumulated that it is not possible to simply to reject it. And so this is with uh, the discovery of Copernicus and then of Galileo, uh, when the Pope, uh, uh, through the Inquisition, threatened Galileo with the torture instruments and so on. This was a horrible injustice and a horrible mistake. Uh, 60 years or 70 years earlier, Copernicus met with the Pope and the Pope had given uh, his agreement to the, uh, to the new uh, uh, heliocentric uh, type of, uh, of a system. And so, but then uh, 60, 70 years later, the Reformation had taken place and the church became neurotic. And um, somehow this fearfulness of the Pope uh, um, was expressed in, in his attitude toward uh, Galileo, who had to spend the rest of his life in uh, house arrest. Uh, this is the position, I think, of the uh, critical theory of religion to emphasize that one keeps the uh, dialogue or the discourse between the two sides open, that one is aware that both sides are a human project and that therefore there is always the possibility that uh, five years from now, ten years from now, new discoveries are made, not only on the, uh, on the scientific side, but also on the religious side as well. Neither of these sides must be taken in, in static terms as if they were unchangeable. Uh, so that, uh, I think, sums up what uh, the critical theory has to say about this antagonism of uh, uh, religion and modernity. 
and taking both sides uh, seriously in terms of a mutual recognition. Even if one thinks that the other side is wrong, he is still a human being and deserves to be respected. So mutual respect on both sides. I think it, is, it was really Adorno who introduced this very important idea of the um, longing for the totally other. Um, Rudolf Otto had used something like this. Uh, Adorno may also have learned it from uh, Hegel's logic. Um, so it means religion. Religion was defined by Adorno and Horkheimer as the longing for the totally other than the horror and terror in nature and history. Um, there were other um, definitions which explained it. it was also the longing for unconditional love, or it was the longing for perfect justice, or it was the longing that the murderer shall ultimately not triumph over the innocent victim. So in real history, we see that the mass murderer, particularly in high places and so on, may really get away with things. He may not be sent to the Nuremberg trial or to the Tokyo trial or to the Den Haag tribunal or whatever. And the innocent victims may lay in their shallow graves while the murderers celebrate cocktail parties and so on. But religion means that one has this longing that ultimately the murderer shall not triumph over the innocent victim. So in that sense, the critical theory translates deep beliefs in which we have in Islam and in Christianity and in Judaism in Judgment Day, and that there will ultimately be uh, um, that history already, world history is world judgment, but that there will be an ultimate judgment. So um, that was what um, Horkheimer and Adorno developed and we have other theories by uh, Eric Fromm, uh, for instance, or we have uh, theories by Adorno and Benjamin. But uh, I think that this idea um, of the longing for the totally other uh, uh, was a fundamental motif throughout the, uh, throughout the critical theory. And of course, both of them were dialecticians. So that means um, that one world religion um, determinately negated the previous one. Determinate negation meant that it was not abstractly negated. That means Buddhism did not simply say Hinduism is nonsense or whatever. Christianity did not simply say um, the, the covenants of Judaism don't count anymore. Uh, or uh, Protestantism did not simply say that Catholicism was all wrong. But it was the idea that it was something, an other religious form was specifically denied, but at the same time it was also preserved and elevated and uh, somehow also fulfilled. So that was the attitude which they received already from Hegel. Um, and they emphasized particularly Judaism, but also Christianity and also Buddhism and so on. And so they had the idea, you know, that religions were not all, all on the same level, that um, the Gautama, for instance, uh, made a step forward when he rejected uh, um, Hinduism and tried to find a better theodicy solution. That means to explain suffering and to overcome suffering and discovered the will to life and uh, developed a whole science of asceticism, how one could overcome the will to life uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, its libidinous side, its sexual side, and also its aggressive uh, killer instinct side. So, um, and uh, therefore he created a new religion, but what he called Nirvana was originally Brahma. That means he had some kind of a negative theology. He said what Brahma was not. Uh, rather than positively what he was. And uh, this has uh, strongly influenced uh, uh, Schopenhauer, the great uh, father of uh, Western uh, pessimism and uh, pessimistic uh, metaphysics. And it has influenced Horkheimer and it has influenced uh, Adorno as well, up to um, 
uh, up to their um, up to Adorno's death uh, uh, and Horkheimer's death, they were still concerned with uh, Schopenhauer. They are of course not the only ones. Also, um, um, Freud uh, said when he discovered the death instinct, um, now we are back in the camp of Schopenhauer again. Uh, and he, Freud had to go that way against his own will. And also, strangely enough, people like Hitler and uh, Goebbels, the last thing they discussed in the bunker in, uh, in Berlin, uh, or rather over the telephone, was the philosophy of Schopenhauer. Nevertheless, I think that uh, um, we have, uh, of course, Karl Barth in Protestantism, who also used this idea of the totally other. And, and the critical theories uh, longing for the totally other differs somehow from Karl Barth's and from the dialectical theology of Karl Barth uh, in that sense that Karl Barth has may maybe still more mythology left. So in that sense, um, Horkheim and Adorno are great enlighteners and enlightenment means to a large extent to uh, demythologize. As I said before, the, the idea came from uh, from Adorno and um, was eight years younger than Horkheimer and Horkheimer took it over. So in the last decade or so of their life they very often spoke about this longing for the totally other. They defined theology and they defined religion as this longing for the totally other, for perfect justice, for uh, unconditional love and particularly for that that the murderer shall ultimately not triumph over the innocent victim. I mean, this is somehow uh, the core of Christianity, that there was a, a, a poor man and the rich people murdered him, according to Marx. But that was not the last word. According to the faith of the Christians, Jesus was resurrected and he went to the right side of the Father. So his killing, this injustice, the murder of the poor man by the rich and the powerful was not the last word of history. And anyway, in this longing for the totally other is, uh, in this is preserved the divinity of Judaism. That means Yahweh or uh, Elohim or El Shaddai. Um, it is, you could say, concretely superseded but it is still present in this longing. And we have on the gravestone of Horkheimer, the second verse of Psalm 91, in you, eternal one, alone I trust. So it means that somebody who has this longing for the totally other can still use older religious language, for instance, the language of the Psalms, in order to express what he, what he feels. Now, if that definition religion is this longing for the totally other is really adequate you know that has to be tested and if there would be one religion which does not have this longing then the theory would have to be uh, reformed and reshaped <coughs> so uh, therefore um, as i said before the the positivistic side must not be forget forgotten religion uh, has to answer to th theories and the positivistic theory, the correspondence theory between protocol sense and facts and so on, is also true for, um, for religion. Only religion has a truth concept which goes far beyond positivism. So if, if uh, uh, Jesus stands before the skeptic Pilate and uh, Pilate asks him if he's a king and so on, then he says, you know, I have come and I was born for this to give witness to the truth. That is not a historical truth. It means truth as the negation of human alienation, of human abandonment, of human of social injustices. That is what the truth is. <laughs>
The critical theory is dialectical. That means it looks also dialectically at positivism. So positivism in all its forms, since Kant, he is the inventor of the word and the inventor of positive sociology and so on. So they have done, of course, tremendous work if one thinks of po uh, Talcott Parsons and so on. So this is very much appreciated. So a student who comes to my class must not forget everything what he learned in the positivistic sociology of, uh, of religion, like Emil Durkheim or, or Max Weber or so. So they have done great things. But um, why it is not enough to look at it positivistically is that religion is not concerned only with what is the case. As a matter of fact, religion is concerned uh, with that what ought to be and what may not be identical with what is the case, which may be other than what is the case. And so one would miss you know, the very core of religion. If we define religion as the longing for the totally other or so, religious people are interested in the transcendence of that what is the case. And if one pulls them down to what is the case, you are just another group and, and so on and so on, and studies that psychologically, sociologically, one would miss the real point. One could not understand Martin Luther King and his prophetic uh, uh, um, element. Uh, adequately if one would do it only positivistically. So in our religion department we had uh, one form of uh, positivistic um, religiology and that was cognitivism, a cognitive type of uh, theory of religion. Uh, and uh, I have always represented the uh, critical or the dialectical theory of religion. And that is fine. In the same department we had these two types of theories. The others were historians and were also looking at things positivistically. So the two things do not exclude each other. Uh, the, the dialectician has to know also the facts and the data and what is the case. So the two sides can work uh, uh, toward each other. Well, the critical theory is called dialectical exactly because it is concerned with the dialectics between the religious and the secular. There are two other forms of dialectics, and that is the dialectic of modernity itself, and then also the dialectics of religion in itself. So the dialectics between the religious and the secular means this antagonism between the two, and this antagonism has developed in the Renaissance and the Reformation. It had been um, developed before um, beginnings in China with the gunpowder and in Quiz with the uh, steam engine, but it didn't take off. So modernity took off then in the West, and we think today that by 1917 or 18, with the end of the First World War, it had come to its end and that afterwards a transition period has set in, so we are in this transition period. We do not have post-modernity yet. Uh, we are still to some extent at the end of modernity. So, um, so the critical theory of religion is concerned with this antagonism and with its reconciliation. You have to know this antagonism very well, the religious and the secular side, in order to come to a reconciliation. But there are two other forms of dialectics involved, and that is the dialectics in modernity itself. Enlightenment means to free people from their fears and to make them into masters of their fate. But obviously something has gone wrong in modernity. The more rationalization set in in the West, the more irrationality came up, the irrationalities of the wars of fascism and so on. The more integration there was, the more union and so on, the more disunion uh, also developed. So this is the dialectics of enlightenment. Somehow we uh, gave our soul, uh, paid with our soul for this uh, great technological progress. So the question is now, um, you know, should one simply go uh, into postmodernity and negate modernity? Or should one look for this communicative rationality? That means that modernity promised that people could live together in a friendly way, what we call alternative future number three, in a reconciled, in a free, in a just society. 
So the praxis philosophers to whom the Frankfurt School belongs still think that, that modernity has this potential, and particularly Habermas and so on. While the deconstructionists, the postmodernists and so on, uh, like Foucault, they think that uh, they try to deconstruct all the universals, all the notions which, by which Americans and Europeans understood themselves since the great French Revolution. And the neoconservatives, which have just been in power for up to recently, they want to stop the cultural modernization, but continue the economic modernization. And as they continued the economic modernization, they drove the whole world economy into this disaster, which we had last year and which continues. Uh, they wanted to stop this cultural modernization, which contained really the bourgeois enlightenment, the Marxist enlightenment and the Freudian enlightenment. And they wanted to keep religion, but not the wisdom religion of the Taoists, of the Chinese, and not the mystical religion like Buddhism and Hinduism, not the prophetic religion like Judaism, Christianity and Islam, but a service religion. Um, this is the neoconservative uh, concept of religion as a contingency experience management system of civil society, which is very contradictory to what these religions, how they understand themselves. Certainly Martin Luther King or Avers or Malcolm X and so on do not fit into this neoconservative concept of religion. So, but one has to see, the, the uh, critical theorists also see that there is not only a dialectics of enlightenment, but there is also a dialectics of religion. That means that the religion of love can suddenly become uh, a motivation for crusades, for killing uh, 10 million women as witches or uh, with all kinds of uh, uh, army chaplains and so on. So that means the religion itself can turn against itself like the Enlightenment can turn against itself. The uh, critical theory uh, agrees with, uh, with Kung, with Hans Kung, the great theologian, that there can be any peace, there cannot be any peace among nations without peace among the religions, and there cannot be any peace among religions without mutual understanding of these religions, and also mutual understanding between the religion and the secular world. Uh, and uh, this needs hard work. One cannot speak about a person of another religion that he is not a Muslim, or that he is a bad Muslim, or bad Christian, or bad Jew, or whatever, if one doesn't know the Torah, and if one doesn't know the New Testament, and one doesn't know the Holy Quran. Otherwise, it's just an opinion, and uh, which counts for nothing, but it can be very, uh, very dangerous when such opinions uh, form the attitude of masses and masses of people. And it can then contribute to the conflict uh, between the civilizations instead of having reconciliation between the civilizations. I have the, the impression that many Americans still don't understand what has really happened on September 11th that this was not an attack of a world religion against another world religion, then they would have bombed St. Patrick's Cathedral. For a thousand years, they had trouble with the Catholics. Or in, in Washington, they would have attacked the, uh, the, uh, the Episcopalian Cathedral, which is up at the horizon and is easy to, to hit. It was an attack against modernity. It was an attack, attack against the modern financial district, just a few steps away from Wall Street. That same Wall Street, which then in the following uh, eight years uh, showed its face by its, uh, by its collapse. And it was against uh, the um, secular military power, namely the Pentagon. And it probably was also planned an attack against the White House and, and the Congress. So the financial district does the stealing, the Pentagon does the killing for the stealing, and the White House or the Congress lies about the stealing and the killing and so on. That is what it looks like through the eyes of a believer when he looks at the first form of modernity, which is the bourgeois modernity. After in Afghanistan, they think they have uh, uh, taken down uh, the second form of modernity, namely the socialistic one. So uh, this conflict has to be understood if we want to really resolve it. Or if we don't want to resolve it, that we have to spend the blood of the young generation. 
I always think, and I told this to my children and to my grandchildren, that if one can think things through, one does not have to suffer through. And I think to diminish suffering is very important. But in order to diminish suffering, one has to think. And that is thought is what the critical theory of society and of religion emphasizes all the time. The great scholar uh, Jürgen Habermas uh, made a linguistic shift or introduced a linguistic turn <coughs> into the critical theory. That means the critical theory originally was very much concerned with <coughs> the human potential of work and tool <coughs> and um, so was um, Adam Smith and so was Marx and so was the Frankfurt School. But um, Habermas shifted from this human potential of work and tool over to the human potential of language and of the universal, evolutionary universal of uh, the uh, mutual recognition. He looked for communicative elements uh, uh, rational elements, commutative rational elements, also in religion, like in the Enlightenment. And in recent years, he has written a lot about the consciousness of what is missing, or how one can speak, or how one can have a new translation about religion, of religion, um, or the whole issue between um, religion and rationality, or religion and naturalism. So he has been deeply involved, particularly since September 11th, uh, also in questions of uh, uh, religious fundamentalism on one side, but also positivism and naturalism on the other side. And his um, uh, recommendation is really that one has an open discourse. He himself went to Iran, he went to Tehran, he had discussions with the mullahs there and so on. And so uh, now it may be, it may sound uh, very optimistic um, that really language, that uh, discourses could really solve these religious problems or could also solve modern issues like the class struggle and so on. His great contribution, I think, is that he uh, opened up a framework in which uh, different, uh, particularly religious people and secular people can talk with each other. So his whole discourse theory um, can, be, can be very helpful. Um, after the, the head of the state in, in Iran had written an article in the Frankfurt newspaper um, that uh, they appreciate uh, modernity, but they want to keep their identity, nobody had answered the Iranian government. The Christian Democrats were quiet, the Social Democrats were quiet, uh, but Habermas then gave really the answer by showing how such a discourse could take place in mutual respect and in mutual understanding. Because when people of different civilizations talk with each other, there are easily misunderstandings happening for, for which nobody is really immediately responsible. So all the uh, studies in language which, uh, um, which Habermas did and the introduction of a linguistic turn into the critical theory uh, can, be, can be very helpful in terms of different religions speaking with each other. But what seems to me at the moment much more important in how different uh, religions uh, and the modernity can speak with each other. Because if there is no discourse between the, real, the modern world and religion, then there will be tensions growing. And when these tensions are growing, then there will be an explosion. And September 11th was an explosion. But um, when Habermas demands that um, uh, religion needs new translators, I think that Marx and Freud could be very helpful to those translators so that we get beyond the bourgeois type of religion, bourgeois type of Christianity. Uh, I visited um, Professor Habermas once and we discussed uh, particularly uh, Benjamin and I asked him if Benjamin is a genuine theologian and he uh, 
nodded and uh, affirmed that uh, Benjamin is a real theologian. Um, somehow we have a, a reasoned uh, um, article about uh, um, Habermas where he says, I have become old but not pious. So, so in a certain sense, Habermas um, agrees with Max Weber who said that he was not uh, religiously musical. But in all my meetings uh, um, with Habermas, I had the feeling that he had a deep sensitivity, particularly for, um, for Jewish mysticism. Maybe one could say that Habermas has become somewhat uh, more realistic um, and maybe less optimistic and so on, but he continues to present his message. And I think he is right in that if we think that speaking is too weak or whatever, we only have to think that if we do not have a discourse, then we will have uh, violence and we may have war. Um, I do have uh, a lot of students from Saudi Arabia and other places in the Near East in my classes. And so, um, Yes, it is of course true um, that they come to the West, to America or to Europe uh, in order to uh, study the sciences um, and uh, our sciences, natural and social sciences and particularly the natural sciences, um, of course all are based of, on instrumental or functional rationality. And um, on the other hand, uh, the students think or it was told to them or they know it by themselves that um, the other side, communicative rationality, is really the basis of the religious texts. So uh, they do not have to study, so they may think, our uh, general studies um, because they have those humane and humanistic values all in the Holy Quran. And uh, so they may not really see why they should do these general studies at all and um, what will be needed in Saudi Arabia later on is uh, high finance or, or engineering or whatever. The students think that uh, they take you know, these technical or whatever uh, disciplines and then keep on the other side the Quran and keep their religious communicative rationality and action, but it doesn't work that way. Um, without their knowing and feeling it, uh, this training uh, in instrumental rationality undermines and suffocates the communicative rationality as it has done for Westerners. And uh, suddenly they may notice when they go back through Cairo or Riyadh to come to Riyadh or whatever, uh, after three or four years that something has happened to them it is not that an individual doctrine that God has created the world or Allah has created the world or whatever, that such a doctrine has come in doubt or that anybody has attacked it in the West. What has been removed in a certain sense is the communicative rationality basis on which subjectively the Holy Quran rests. So that there is no basis anymore to compare uh, Islam with Christianity or whatever all these world religions somehow be seem to be illusionary in a certain sense because they make no contribution to instrumental rationality, means, purpose type of thinking, which you really need in order to get a job and to make it in this world and so on. So you will less and less see what the Quran, what good it really does. You know, if you make a rational choice, you don't know really why you should make a rational choice for any of these world religions. So. And here, I mean, Habermas and others, the, the older critical theorists criticized always instrumental rationality, but Habermas added to it a lot of knowledge about this communicative rationality. You could say it is some kind of a logic of the heart, which seems to be stupid or whatever in terms of this instrumental rationality, but it uh, sounds stupid only because we have lost our sense for this other form of rationality, for this mimetic rationality. And so the question of the critical theory in society and religion is, is it still time that one, without diminishing 
uh, the instrumental rationality. Because if we would, we would starve to death. We obviously need these machines in order to survive with six or whatever billion people on this earth. So uh, not less instrumental rationality, but is it possible to lift up, uh, to develop further this communicative rationality that we don't sit in wonderful airplanes and there are wonders and miracles of instrumental rationality and at the same time our marriages go to pieces, our inner cities are deserted and, uh, and we, uh, the uh, whole necrophilia, the death friendliness is overwhelming uh, in, the, in the movies and in the abortion raid and in the killing raid abroad and, and all this. So uh, is it possible to overcome, uh, or to n not to diminish uh, the, uh, the instrumental rationality, but to develop further this communicative rationality? And I think one may say that this will be uh, uh, important for the survival of the human species. This has been the first in a series of introspective conversations on the critical theory of religion with Professor Rudolf J. Siebert. If you'd like to support the continuing effort to create more of these enlightening programs, please send your donation in any amount to Professor Rudolf J. Siebert, 630 Piccadilly, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 49006. This has been a Moondog Films production.